Um, I'm doing something a bit different. I've done this talk a few times, and I usually do it in the, in the form of like typical presentation in front of folks like you. Uh, it's slides, and then a demo, and then slides, and then a demo, and there's a lot of context switching, a lot of hopping around. So I decided for this go round, I would try something different, and I would have no slides. Everything you're going to see is directly in a browser or on a desktop. So I'm going to fail miserably multiple times probably, but hopefully you like seeing people fail, because I definitely do when I'm on stage. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Isaac Levin. I am a .NET developer advocate for a small company called Amazon Web Services. Um, if you have heard of them, yay! If you haven't heard of them, go up to the booth that we have um, up in front of the main ballroom. Uh, we have some swag, stickers, and some great conversations to be had. Um, just so I get an idea of like what kind of folks I'm talking to, who here is like a developer or is interested in being a developer? Interested is like questionable, right? Like, yeah, do I, I was forced to be a developer. I like being, I like doing ops. I like doing system administration stuff. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, can you learn .NET? Um, I just wanted to get an idea because I, I can show code. I cannot show code. If it doesn't matter to folks, I, I won't show code. Um, but my job is talking about .NET specifically, usually, to folks. But in this particular talk, I want to talk about something that I'm also very passionate about, and that's tools that we can use to make ourselves more successful as technologists. And who here uses GitHub daily today? Who here has heard of GitHub? All right, who here does not like GitHub? Oh, I'm gonna convince you that GitHub is not that bad. Not that bad. All right, so I think the first, and the, you know, the, my goal for this talk is to show you some things that you might not have been aware of regarding GitHub. Um, different functionality, different tools, different things that you can do that can, might help you in your world, depending, or regardless of what kind of stuff you do. I think the first thing, who here has a GitHub profile? Like, it's, has seen stuff like this, right? So you have the ability in GitHub to configure like a profile, because GitHub, good, bad, or indifferent, it is a social network. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise. You know, there are stars, there are likes, there are friends, there are follows, all that sort of stuff. It just so happens also to be a place where developers can host their source code. Um, but GitHub is so much more than hosting source code. Who here is aware of some of the other things that GitHub does other than hosting source code? Right. Let's, let's rephrase that. Who here thinks GitHub is the, only pl is the only thing that GitHub is for is hosting source code? All right, cool. I th so I think at the end of the day, a couple of things is very interesting. One, social networks, so that means you have to, you know, Configure your persona, right? So this is um, my profile, and as you can see here, I can I list out some of the different ways you can reach out to me. You know, across all the different social networks, there's way too many of them, unfortunately. Uh, technologies that I'm interested in, and also if you contribute to projects in the open source or you contribute to projects even in your organization, you can list out information about those projects. So one things one of the things that I don't know I'm quote unquote known for. Um, if you know who I am, if you don't, I yeah, that's fine too. Um, I, I created a, an open source project called Presence Light. And what Presence Light basically does is it takes your Microsoft Teams presence. So if you're green or you're yellow or you're orange or purple or fuchsia or whatever your colors are, you can send that to Smart Lights. So it's Philips Hue or LifeX or different things like that. And it connects directly to your Teams tenant and it can change lights in your house. So if you work from home, your kids can ignore a red light and come into your office anyway. Um, so. But basically, what this profile does is it, sh it allows me to configure at my heart's content what I want. And one really, really cool thing that I love showing, just because you can do this in GitHub, if I, for instance, this is light theme, right? I don't like light theme because sometimes it's hard to read. I can change the appearance in GitHub and change it to dark by default. And if I go back to my profile, the, c the text changed, the icons change. So you can do really, really cool things because the, the, Profile that you see here, it's all actually in Markdown. And I can actually show you what it is, what it takes to take my uh, profile and make it what it looks like today. So, for instance, this is the GitHub repository for my profile. 
And there's a lot of stuff in here. But at the end of the day, what people actually see is this, which is the readme file, which is in Markdown. If you're not familiar with Markdown, it's, uh, it's a text-based uh, language that allows you to configure different things. And it's the, I guess, the official language of GitHub. So what I think is really, really cool about my profile specifically is that mine updates every five minutes. So in the situation where, you know, for instance, my stars change or totals or contributions change, it updates every five minutes because I have a process that runs every five minutes to update this particular page. And I'm not going to get into that because it's, it's pretty nerdy. And if you want to learn more, uh, there will be a link um, later on in this talk with a bunch of other stuff um, and a bunch of stuff as it pertains to uh, tips that we're going to talk about today as well as how I manage my profile. So that's a profile and I mean at the end of the day like, hey Isaac, you spent six minutes talking about yourself, that's really, really cool, can we talk about GitHub please? So with GitHub, there are a couple of really, really cool things that you might not be aware of. So GitHub is now not just a place where you host your source code, it's also a place where you can manage the entire life cycle of your project, right? Um, the, the phrase in the industry is DevOps platform or uh, software development lifecycle platform, depending on how old you are. Um, but at the end of the day, there are all sorts of different functionalities, different features that you have inside of GitHub to make your life better. And if you do have a GitHub profile, I highly recommend you go up and click on your little avatar up at the top, and you can go down to Feature Preview. What Feature Preview does is it shows you all the different new things that GitHub is trying out with different folks. So as you can see here, you can add colorblind themes or command palettes. And something that just actually came out a few days ago was slash commands. So this is a new UI for GitHub. So in the past, there was a search bar up at the top and a bunch of stuff. But inside of here, you can do, you know, you can just type for like PowerShell, for instance. And it'll return repositories that are related to PowerShell, right? And you can do this all from that, little, that you know, unibar or whatever they're called, unisearch bars. So that's cool. And you can filter and look through all sorts of really, really cool things as it pertains to finding different repositories that might enlighten your day. But that's not what we want to talk about right now. Are you going to update? All right, cool. So managing projects. Who here has had to like, manage projects or like, look at things like burn down charts, um, estimates, things like that? Who here is, does stuff like that? Who here likes doing those things? That number changed substantially. Um, yeah, so, like, so whether you're a developer of one, or a technologist of one, or a technologist group of many, you can manage your entire experience inside of GitHub. So as you can see here, this is a list of tasks that I have for my awesome project. And I can do things uh, like specify the iteration, I can change status, I can do all the things that you can do in other tools, which is pretty, pretty cool. But what's really beneficial is that it's directly correlated to my GitHub team, as well as my GitHub source code. I can also do things like change the layout. I can change it to like a more of a Kanban board, if that's your style, and I can move things. So for instance, I've already uh, uh, finished this. I can convert this to an issue, or I can archive, I can delete from the project. And then we're gonna go through a handful of things, and I'm probably not gonna hit all of these things, because probably some of them aren't interesting to you folks. But we're gonna talk about some of the, going through this list of all the different things that GitHub can do to make us more successful. So I think the first place, since, I think it's fair to say that most of you folks like the command line, right? Yeah, you love PowerShell, you love the command. Who here has played around with like the GitHub CLI? Or do you hear CLI and you immediately think of like Bash and you're like, Bash is the gross, Bash is the worst. Who would use Bash? Windows only. Um, no, but you can actually spin up the GitHub uh, CLI, which basically is a command line interface for GitHub. And so let me zoom in a little bit here. Anybody play around with this? Microsoft Terminal? If you're not, you're missing out. It's free and it's awesome. So you can do things like GitHub search repositories for PowerShell. And this will actually do the same thing that I showed earlier. But it, it lists it out in this command line view. And you can do things like clone, you can create PRs, create issues, all from the command line and it goes directly out to GitHub. So that's kind of cool, right? Who knew you could do that? Yeah? And so the people that didn't raise their hand are like, am I going to learn something today from this guy? Probably not, but we'll keep on marching on. You can also do something very, very similar inside of GitHub Desktop. So who here, if you're a developer, has, you, uses GitHub Desktop? Or you use a different um, mechanism for managing your source code locally? GitHub Desktop, somewhat? Yeah, GitHub Desktop is all right. 
But what GitHub Desktop allows you to do is it allows you to have that same experience. You can create PRs, you can create issues, all from a, a GUI interface in Windows. So you don't have to go out to the web. The web is awesome, however. So, so GitHub CLI, GitHub Desktop, and I think one of the big things that I like to talk about as well is just being inside of GitHub, there's some things that we can do. So I have this cool GitHub Tips repository. It's open source, millions of people love it, not really, nothing's here. Um, if anybody is curious to see some of the links that you're gonna see here, if you scan that QR code right now, I'll pause for effect. There'll be a link to, no, no, a bunch of different blog posts and different content that you'll see around GitHub. Um, what's really, really cool about GitHub, whenever you're in a repository, you can just click one key, and that is dot. And what dot does is it brings you to an interactive web editor directly in the browser. And you can actually do things. It's not just read-only. You can actually write to it. So for instance, right here, I, I'm inside. This kind of looks like VS Code, right? Who here is, looks, this is, oh, this looks like VS Code. Who here uses VS Code daily, right? Does this look like VS Code in the browser? Did you know you could do this? Some people are nodding. Some people are like, dude. All right, so what I can do here is I have this README file, right? And this is read-only, or not read-only, but that I have write access too. So I can do some things like, hello, PowerShell. Oh, I should capitalize the S or I'm gonna get kicked out. But then I have this little thing right here that says, do I wanna commit and push those changes? So typically, when we're committing to a repository, we have to do a little dance. We have to clone the repository to our local. We have to make those changes, and then we have to put, commit and push them back up. Or if we're just changing one file, we can add directly in the browser. When you're using github.dev, you can make multiple changes. So like for instance here, let me just change this license because MIT license but Isaac's version. That's not a problem, right? So as you can see, I have the ability to edit multiple files at the same time and commit and push at the same time. So when I do that, this, oh, let's just do this, updates and commit and push. And then, they're like, okay, Isaac, that's really, really cool, but how do I get back? You can go to the, you can use the command palette, same thing like you would in Visual Studio Code. So control shift P, and then you can go remote repositories, go to repository. And it'll take you right back to the repository you were. And as you can see here, we have our change, hello PowerShell, and our license file, which was updated not too long ago. That's kind of cool, right? So one of the cool things also that I love about GitHub is that it's customizable. So you can actually go out to GitHub, best extensions, and there's a list of browser extensions for GitHub. And I love showing this because it shows you that just because GitHub is a platform doesn't mean that you don't get the ability to customize it. It's a website, right? So you can do whatever you want. You can write scripts against it. You can configure the CSS. You can do whatever you like. And there's some great folks out in the community as well as companies that have built really, really interesting extensions. And I have a few of them, for instance. Like if you go, let me just change this back to com. All the stuff you see here, like um, how big the file size is, let me just go back to that. When it was updated, like these things are customized, right? These things aren't included with GitHub out of the box. So you can actually go ahead and install some of these things. Like for instance, my favorite one, if I scroll down, is, where is it? Every time I come here, there's more and more. Refined GitHub. Refined GitHub, basically it's like GitHub on steroids. So all the code here is, is open source and it shows you what some of the great things that it provides. So like here's some of the highlights, like makes, high, makes white space characters visible, blah, 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 and you can go and, and see some, what some of these different extensions do. But it's about catering the tool to your experience and to your needs. Just don't think GitHub is the place where like, oh, I'm gonna play around with, um, I'm gonna commit my repository, I'm gonna you know, add, add my scripts, and then I may do a little bit of CI and CD, and that was whatever. No, you're in the tool a lot, so you should build the tool and configure the tool in a way that you enjoy. All right, so let's go on and let's talk a little bit. We talked about github.dev, and what github.dev is great is that you have that ability to read and write files. But there's a couple of things missing here. So if I go back, what are some of the things that we do in VS Code every day? We hit control, control C, that's one, we copy paste. We hit control, uh, what is it? No, tilde or whatever it is. The thing up at the top left, uh, what are they called? Tilde, right? So what happens when you hit control tilde in VS Code? It brings up your PowerShell prompt. And then we're like, we're PowerShell people, give me the prompt. GitHub.dev, you don't have that experience because it is 
not running on a server. It's running in your browser. So what if I want to be able to do things like actually write code or write some scripts, test them in an environment, but I don't want to do it on my machine? Do you think you can do that in GitHub today? Maybe. So let's go back to github.com of this particular repository. And I can go into this code section here. And if I go to, let me zoom in one. If I go to code, I have some options I can clone or I can do open with GitHub Desktop, Visual Studio, or I can do what's called a code space. Who here has heard of GitHub code spaces? Right? So GitHub code spaces, in actuality, it is a um, developer environment that's in the cloud that you access through different mechanisms. You can access it through Visual Studio Code, you can access it through um, JetBrains tools, or you can do it in the browser. So what I can do here is I can create a code space for this particular project. And what this will do is it'll actually take that repository that I have and it'll create a localized environment, our server, or not localized environment, a cloud-based environment for that repository. So I can do things like run PowerShell scripts, I can run um, different builds, I can do all sorts of stuff. And it does it for me really, really quickly. Like, who, like when you set up your machines, when you get a new one, like how long does it usually take to set up a new laptop for you folks? Like a minute? Like a week? Like a month? Like a year, right? So think about this. GitHub Codespaces allows you to create an environment. I click that button, and we're still creating it, but like in the matter of minutes, right? So GitHub actually uses this to build GitHub.com. They use this tool. Like they don't have super beefy laptops or super beefy machines running, you know, 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes or what have you, what have you. They use GitHub Codespaces for that. Now, go to code space is really, really interesting. Is that it, it builds this code space for you, and I um, don't know why this is taking so long. Probably because I'm demoing something. Um, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to get that really, really high fidelity access to all sorts of different things: ter terminal, local storage on some storage mechanism, um, as well as the ability to configure the size of these machines. And I don't know why this is why is this taking so long. Goodness gracious! Output tasks. I don't know. Mm, I don't know what any of that means. All right, so let's move on, and maybe I'll come back to this in a little bit. I was going to talk about devcontainer.json as a part of that, but devcontainer.json basically is a mechanism that allows you to define your environment. So we said, okay, I have this environment here, and um, I hit the create code space button and it creates me an environment that I can use. But like, what if I have a bunch of tools? Like what if I need a specific version of PowerShell on my machine? What if I need Ruby or .NET? Uh, what if I like specific extensions in Visual Studio Code? You can add all of those things into a dev container.json and uh, go on your merry way and have that environment for you whenever you need it. So did this actually finish? No, it's still setting up. All right, let's move on to GitHub Actions. Who here has heard of GitHub Actions? Yeah, that makes sense. That, that, that tracks with, with a PowerShell and DevOps Summit. That definitely tracks. So here's a good question. Who here uses GitHub Actions in their job today? No. One, two. Who here uses like Azure DevOps? Who here uses um, Code Catalyst or Code Suite, some of the AWS offerings and the, the CI CD space? Jenkins, Circle CI, Travis CI. All right. So most of the folks here use some form of like hosted CI CD. Um, I didn't ask. Who here uses like Team Foundation Server still on prem? I know one person here is lying by not raising their hand. <laughs> you are? That's fine. That's awesome. Team Foundation Server still rocks. Not gonna lie. So, but yeah, I th for the most part, a lot of folks now are, are companies are looking to transition from on-prem based CI CD DevOps solutions to cloud-based ones, and there's a million of them out there. GitHub provides one called GitHub Actions, which if you're familiar with Azure DevOps, it's very, it looks very similar. Like you're still using YAML files, the, um, the definition of those YAML, the schema of those YAML files are very similar. If you actually look at some of the logs, it actually says that it runs on like Azure Compute, which is kind of cool. Um, but what GitHub Actions allows you to do pretty quickly is create workflows that work on specific business needs. So like, so for instance, if you 
you need to do a .NET build, or you need to publish to AWS, or you need to send a PagerDuty announcement, or any of these things, there's great integrations for them. And even so, you can actually go and look at the marketplace, so GitHub Actions, marketplace, if I could not hit enter too fast. If you go to the GitHub Actions marketplace, and you can see that there's over 18,000 actions that exist. Right? So these are ones that are either created by companies or created by individuals to solve particular tasks. So like, I'm gonna just call out somebody random in the crowd and let's see how this works. Um, who's actually not making eye contact with me that I can buy? Gentleman in the Wisconsin shirt was not looking at me, so I'm gonna call on him. So what is something that you do as a part of your existing CI CD process? Just one thing, take your time, no one's waiting. Everything's Azure, oh man. I work at AWS, that's not cool. Um, <laughs> all, right, let, all right, let's do this. Oh, let's just do this. Um, let's do PagerDuty. I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to be boring here. So I can send a PagerDuty, who here uses PagerDuty as a part of their job? All right, cool, that tracks. So I can actually go today and I can actually use a snippet from uh, this particular GitHub workflow that allows me to send a PagerDuty alert. So in the past, you know, if you've had to do these sort of things, you've had to configure the alert, you've had to you know, set up the webhook, you've had to do all these things. With this, you drop this into your existing CI CD and you're like, okay, cool. Here's the information, here's the integration key and here's the dedupe key, right? And then at the end of the day, my alerts are all set up whenever I need them fire for a particular reason. And again, there are 18,000. So I'm not gonna call on that guy from Wisconsin again because he runs everything in Azure. But um, at the end of the day, like most of your things, you can figure out an action for. And if you can't, you can build actions yourself. And when I say build actions yourself, like what does that actually look like? So I can click into the actions piece here and I can click on new workflow. And it'll give me a handful of different options. So maybe I want to deploy a Node.js, I I can't read that. Uh, you can deploy to Amazon ECS, you can deploy to something else, but you have all these different experiences and there's tons of them, right? So I, let's just do this. Let's just click on the simple workflow, which I've already config created, so it configures it for me. So what does this actually look like? It's too many scroll bars. So is this readable for folks in the back or no? No, all right. Let's see if this actually, let's see if I can find a way to zoom in. Is that zoomed in enough? All right. This is gonna look terrible, but it doesn't matter. So YAML, which is, stands for yet another markable language, is the way that we define our CI and CD. And the action, or the process that kicks off a action, it uh, uses the nomenclature for on. So on push or on pull requests are like two of the big ones. You're gonna have like also actions that fire when you create new issues, or uh, actions that fire when particular webhooks are hit, and so on and so forth. Or in this particular case, workflow dispatch, which means you can run it manually. You can also run it on, in scheduled as well. So what does this actual action do? So it declares, it runs on Ubuntu latest. You can have it be Windows latest or Mac OS latest. It does a GitHub checkout. So it checks out the source code from this particular GitHub repository. And then it runs like a one line script. So echo, hello world, this is bash. You could obviously have it be PowerShell if you want. And from here, you can actually just add a bunch of new things. And we're not gonna do that because it'll probably break. Um, and I want people to actually take something from this. Oh look, this is, is this done? This is done, cool. So this is a GitHub code space. Copying back to, from GitHub Actions to GitHub code spaces for a second. So this is a environment that is running with my particular application. So I can do that and it spins up a terminal. So I can do like PWSH version Huh? Yeah, but I thought I had I thought I had PowerShell installed on it. Um, yeah. PowerShell. It's somewhere. Anyway, so you could do like Bash version. Oh, no search bar directory. That's cool. Anyway, let's do this. Uh, AWS version. Oh! Anyway, so you have the ability to do things in the command line. So for instance, let's just do something that I know will work. So I do .NET new console dash O my app, right? So this just creates a, dot, a new .NET application, right? So 
that's cool, Isaac. Um, maybe I'm not a .NET developer. Um, that's not really interesting to me, but this might be interesting to you. So I can go into my app and I can do .NET run inside of here. So what .NET run does is it runs your .NET 7 or .NET 6 application, depending on what versions you have. And what's really, really cool about GitHub Actions is I can actually, or not GitHub Actions, GitHub Code Spaces, is I can actually debug these experiences. So let's just hop out and do something like this. Let's do .NET new web app, dash o web. Yep. No, .NET new. This is what happens when you try to do things too fast. So, and then we're gonna go into web, and then we're gonna do .NET run. So what's interesting when you run a web application is that you should be able to hit some endpoint, right? So what you have the ability to do with GitHub code spaces is that when you run an application that spins up a web server, you get, your application is running on port 55 or 5224 is available. And you can actually open that in a browser. So you can actually debug your application that's running in the cloud through the browser with another thing to the browser, right? That's pretty cool. And one additional thing on top of that that you can do that's pretty cool as well is you can forward that port. So I can go in here and I can make this port, for instance, I can set this port visibility to public. And I can send this link to everybody in this room and you would be able to access it. That's pretty cool, right? Like, who here is a developer and is like, oh, that's kind of cool? Oh, I'm not a developer, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Who isn't a developer and is like, this, the developers are gonna do terrible things in my network? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> developers are the worst. <laughs> All right. So that's GitHub Code Spaces. And so, one thing additional that's really, really cool about GitHub Code Spaces is that you can create these things called dev containers. So I can spin up the command palette again and spin up a, a, a dev container, add dev container configuration file. And it says you can modify your active configuration because with code spaces, one gets created by default. So I can actually take a look at what that looks like. So it, you can say, these are additional features that I'd like to install, or you can create a new one. So let's actually just create a new one just to see what it looks like when you create a new one. Add dev container configuration files, create a new one. Yep, it already exists, that's fine. You can show all your definitions and it'll say like, okay, so these are some of the ones out of the box that you can hit. You can have one that has the Azure CLI built onto it that configures Azure Functions, scrolling down away from Azure, um, MIT scheme, whatever, right? So you can actually build the environment that you want in the cloud very, very quickly. So that's really cool. Something also that I think is really, really cool about using GitHub is if you use, issue, if you do issue tracking inside of GitHub, so like if you use GitHub issues, like, GitHub issues are great because you have the issues directly correlated to your repository. But, like, you expect people to, like, go in there and, like, put in Markdown, and it's kind of a bummer. So what you can actually do is you can use something that's called issue templates. So, for instance, I have this list of awesome stuff here, and I have some pretty cool uh, things here that I can check, and I can convert these directly to issues and all that sort of stuff. But what if I create a new issue? I get this screen. This isn't turned on by default, so you actually have to configure this, but I didn't do anything else other than click a button in GitHub. So I can create a, a bug report or a feature request. If I click a bug report, it'll actually build out a form that, I can, that my users will populate to give me the exact replication scenario that I need to be able to replicate this particular issue. And that's actually pretty simple to set up. So you just go into settings of your GitHub repository, and you scroll down and you click on Issues, and then you set up Templates. Right. So who here knew that you can configure custom templates in GitHub repositories? Nice, nice. Who here didn't know that? Who here doesn't care? You can be honest. Yes, honesty is important. <laughs> honesty is very important. Yeah, so at the end of the day, right, so being able to manage things effectively, issues, triage, what have you, inside of GitHub is really, really valuable, and doing it with issue templates is awesome. So, we've kind of talked about a few things. We talked about issues and PRs and GitHub Dev and Code Spaces and Dev Container JSON and Actions. One thing that's really, really cool about GitHub also is its full embracing of open source. So, GitHub Actions are cool, right? But there's one real big downside to GitHub Actions. And anybody who's ever built a GitHub Action knows what they are. Like debugging them. Like who here has ever had to like build a GitHub Action and gone through the process of debugging it? Dude in the back is just shaking his head with anger. So, 
terrible, right? So like, what if you wanted to take a GitHub action that you built and test it locally in your environment, like on your own machine? So there's this, I don't, I'm not affiliated with this individual at all, but there's this cool project called ACT, which lets you run the, a GitHub Actions environment locally on your machine. So why is that cool? Because if I am debugging or if I'm trying to build a new action, there's a lot of iteration. Maybe I get a PowerShell script wrong. Maybe, I, maybe my output is incorrect. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong directory, so on and so forth. Every single time I want to test that, I have to commit that action, right? And that triggers a workflow and whatever. Like that could be a bummer if like you're trying to like fix like step eight of like a multi-step process. But what if you could do it in your own environment? So this particular, this particular uh, package here called ACT lets you run GitHub Actions or an extent of version of GitHub Actions in your own environment. And this is kind of what it looks like. So that's not what I wanted to show. They changed this readme since like two days ago. Yeah, so you have the ability to like list out all the actions that you have and you can actually kick off particular workflows. And it, you can configure it to run in Windows, you can configure it to run in Linux, you can configure it to run in Mac. So it's not just like, oh, I only get like one type of operating system. You can, if you have WSL on your machine, you'll be able to test it uh, with Ubuntu as well. All right, so what else do we got going on here that's kind of cool? That did get up for Windows. Now GitHub Copilot. Who here has heard of GitHub Copilot? Of course you heard of GitHub Copilot. It's funny because, have you heard of GitHub Copilot because like everybody talks about Copilots now? Or because like you saw the thing a couple years ago and you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. And now everybody's like, hey, you should have a Copilot like for everything. I need like Copilot for Notepad and Copilot for, for I don't know, paint. Um, Clippy. Clippy, well, I mean, all, all Copilot really is is Clippy, let's just be honest. Um, but no, what GitHub Copilot allows you to do is it allows you to get to where you want to go um, in a pair programmer fashion. So here's, here's a cool thing. Let me try it. Let me do this. So I'm going to connect to a code space from Visual Studio Code. So I have Visual Studio Code on my machine. Oh, it wants me to sign into GitHub. This is not going to go well. All right, authorize. No. All right. One second. Pause for effect. It's great that they have two-factor auth, right? But like, not when I'm trying to do a talk. And then it's not gonna actually send it to me because, oh, there we go. Oh. All right. So one thing that's really, really awesome as well is like I showed you a couple of cool things you can do in the browser, right? Like you can do github.dev in the browser, or codespace in the browser, but you can do those, those same things from Visual Studio Code on your laptop or your machine as well. So like right, for instance, right now, I'm connected to that same code space that's running in the browser. I'm connected to it from Visual Studio Code on my machine. And there's a couple of additional steps it's gonna wanna do. It's gonna wanna configure um, some of the additional uh, packages or extensions that I have. But as you can see, like I have that Git of that My App folder. So that My App that I created and that web as well. Um, these are gonna update, there we go. Right, so I have the ability to, depending on how I want to do my work, I can do all my work directly in the browser or I can do it um, locally in Visual Studio Code. All of the stuff that's going on right now, it's not running on my machine. It's running in the cloud, and all, the th all it's coming back to me is the UI or the bits, right? So one of the things I think is really, really cool, specifically about Copilot, is you know, how simple it is to get started. So let's just do this. Let's create a new file, and let's just call it hello.ps1. Hooray! All right, so if I do something like, does it does have Copilot on it before I start doing a bunch of stuff? Uh, unable to find PowerShell, that's a bummer. Let's install PowerShell. Okay, all right, because that makes a lot of sense. Oh, maybe it's because the PowerShell Oh, did it try to select the wrong PowerShell is what happened? So I have code space enabled, right? So let's just do this. So um, read from, that's also not how you comment things out in PowerShell. Is it star? Yeah. Read from file and output to console. Hopefully this will do something. If it doesn't, oh well. All right, well, 
I have something's wrong with my code space because that's how demos work. But I think at the end of the day, what I'm trying to point out is that you have the ability with Copilot to do some really, really interesting things, especially as it pertains to creating scripts for you. Um, there's also some really, really cool stuff coming down the pike with called GitHub Copilot X. I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, that basically is Copilot in the command line. So that's something that um, I've seen a demo of and I've seen a couple of people on, online do demos of as well. So like, for instance, like, I need a PowerShell script that does this. And you hit question mark, question mark, and then it gives you an output, right? And so instead of you having to like go to Google and figure out how, what all the different PowerShell commands are, it can do it for you. All right, so as we keep trudging along, um, one last area that I want to talk about is security. So who here cares about security? No one cares about security, let's be honest here. So who here has like, heard of GitHub Advanced Security? Hmm, interesting. There's one guy here that like, knows all of GitHub, and he could probably do this talk better than me. So GitHub Security, is, it's a set of features that are built into GitHub to make you more secure as a technologist. And a couple of those things are dependency management, vulnerability management, and uh, secrets management. So for instance, here's a, another repository that I have that um, has a couple of interesting quirks to it. So I can actually go in here, nothing looks really crazy. I go to pull requests, and I have these things called bump. So what you can do in, in GitHub is you can actually set, it'll act, you can turn on what's called dependabot and say, I want this to scan my code, and whenever there's new dependencies of packages that I'm dependent, or new, up, new versions of, of packages I'm dependent on, I want you to create a pull request for me that updates that package. Obviously, your mileage may vary on that for a lot of reasons, but it, it does that first step for you, right? And there's some other cool things as well. So if I go to the security section of my repository, I have these vulnerability alerts. So I have these dependabot alerts here, where, which I talked about a little bit. And it tells you the reasoning for why you would want to take this new version of this package. So how many people here, like, they hear, oh, we need to upgrade to the newest version of this particular package because of reasons, and you just believe them? No one does that? Well, I'm really a shitty developer then. Um, so at the end of the day, it shows you exactly what some of the things are from a risk perspective that you should take on. So for instance, in this particular case, it, uh, this is a high one, so Axios inefficient regular expression complexity vulnerability. And then it shows you that it created a pull request to fix this particular vulnerability. And if I can click back here, I can even go even a step further. We'll actually scan my code and look for things that I'm probably doing from an anti-pattern perspective that are potentially dangerous. And this uses um, open databases built by security experts. It's not just like people like, oh, this is a bug. No, like these are actually security vulnerabilities that are well known out in the market. And it'll actually show you your code. And it'll say extracting files from a malicious zip archive without validating that destination file path is within the destination directory can cause files outside. That's like the greatest sentence of all time. It's like 1,500 characters, one sentence. But it shows you, hey, you should update this, this class because you run the risk of potentially running malicious code in your environment. And that's vulnerability scanning. So if I go back, go back to, where was I? Oh, security, not settings. So that was code scanning. So we've done dependency scanning, which is cool, code scanning, which is cool, and then secret scanning. Like who here has like accidentally put like a connection string or a secret and a key into a Git repository, and then you're like immediately Google, like how do I like undo a commit and then delete the history? Like everybody here, right? You're honest. The person over here is honest. The rest of you are liars. Um, what if GitHub told you right when you committed, hey, don't do this? So in this particular case, it did just that. So I have a, a GitHub personal access token that I use to access different things. And it says, hey, you have a possibly active secret. Here are the remediation steps. And if you do with, a, with GitHub tokens, for instance, it'll actually just delete the token. So like if you accidentally commit a token, it'll just delete it which is pretty cool. And this, there's a whole list of supported um, secrets that exist that for cloud providers, for uh, SaaS providers as well. So really, really cool stuff going on here. And so I, I didn't have anything else, and I have about five minutes left. I just wanted to show you folks just at a high level some of the cool stuff that GitHub provides to technologists to make them more effective. Um, let me go back to my profile, because that's the coolest part about me is my profile. And yeah, if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you so much. Yes, sir, in the back. Have you worked with code reaper yet? 
Have I worked with Code Whisperer yet? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the question was, have you worked with Code Whisperer yet? And uh, I will say this right now. I work for Amazon. I work for AWS. I have played around with Code Whisperer. For folks who don't know what Code Whisperer is, it is a uh, sort of a prompt-based code completion tool, similar to maybe a tool that you would have seen or other tools that you see in the market. Um, I have, yes. Is your, is your question, what do I think about it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I figured. Uh, I think Code Whisperer is great in a lot of really in a lot of particular scenarios. Um, if you are a if you develop in JavaScript or Python or C sharp, um, it it does a lot of really interesting stuff, especially if you're building things that are connecting to AWS. So because a lot of the models that it's built are, are looking a lot of really uh, good AWS code. Um, it was just recently announced it's generally available, so you can use it in settings where you, you know, if you feel comfortable using it, if it's not in private preview. Um, and I highly recommend it because the number one thing about uh, Code Whisperer is that it's free if you're an individual, right? So Copilot, for instance, you have to pay GitHub or you have to have open source projects to use Copilot. If you're an individual, you can use Code Whisperer for free today. So definitely check that out if you're interested in learning more about Code Whisperer. Thank you for your question. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, does, sir. Uh, does the GitHub actions when you're developing your own and you can manually trigger to get any terminal output or of any kind? It's the exact same experience as if it was triggered by um, a pull or a push. So like for instance, and I didn't show this because I was just showing a top level, like if you have, if you have required inputs for a GitHub action and you manually trigger one, it'll ask you what those inputs are. And then you get the exact same experience. So we can actually take a look at that. Let's um, GitHub tips. So if I go to the Actions tab here and I look at Updates, I can see my logs. So I have Set Up Job, Run Actions, Run this One Line Script. If I pop that open, it'll do that. And, it, and you can get a lot of logging built into this, right? It's not just you have an output and a failure or a pass, but you can configure this. You can also take one step, too, and you can turn on debugging mode with GitHub Actions and get even more stuff. It'll tell you variable names, unless they're secrets, and then they won't tell it to you, obviously. Um, but this gives you an opportunity to really triage you know, as you're building those actions. Yeah, so the question is, can you run basically like a, a, a version of GitHub Actions that is mine, not in the cloud? And the answer is yes. They have this co concept called self-hosted runners. So exact same, not exact same obviously, but same premise as hosted agent or uh, non-hosted, self-hosted agents. So the idea is if I have some boutique customization to my build environment, right? Maybe I need a very specific version of some particular software, or I need um, particular files available, or what have you. You can do that with GitHub Actions as well. It's not just cloud, you can actually run your own um, build agents as well. So thanks for your question. Anybody else? I have one question for you. Was this okay? I'm not, I'm not, looking, I'm not looking for like, you know, like fake praise. Like this is the first time I've tried to do this completely like without slides, and I'm curious like if it works, right? Uh, it was great. It was great? Yeah. All right, all right. I'll pay you later. Uh, <laughs> so let me just do this before um, I bid you adieu. For the folks that are curious, there's that QR code again. If you want, zooming is weird. Um, so if you want to take a look, this will take you to um, a site called URList, which um, has basically a list of um, sites for different things. There's some blogs from GitHub team, there's some repos in there, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so my name is Isaac Levin. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoy the rest of PowerShell and DevOps Summit. If you want to learn more about what I do, AWS, or you want to talk in general about the session, I'll be up at the booth. Um, not tonight, because I have a family commitment, but I'll be here all day tomorrow, all day the next day, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference, and thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. <laughs>